Good morning, and welcome to Decision Making Voices from the Field Leadership Seminar. My name is Shelley Liu, and I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Biostatistics at Harvard School of Public Health. It is with great pleasure that I introduce to you today Dr. Rafael Bengoa and Dr. Thomas Zeltner. Dr. Bengoa is a Minister of Health and Consumer Affairs of the Basque Country, where he is a true leader in pioneering a new care model based on care for chronically ill patients, improvements in patient safety, prevention, and the continuity of care. Dr. Bengoa is a former Director of Health Systems at the World Health Organization, where he focused on the care of the chronically ill. He is also the former director of the Kronecker Observatory, an independent organization engaged in the analysis of trends in world health and th with the goal of improving health systems. He graduated in medicine from the University of Basque Country and later specialized in health management in England. A phenomenal leader, Dr. Bengoa's influential publications include the well-known Abril Report, which established the basis for remodeling the Spanish health system and a report on remodeling the Basque Health System, which he wrote while serving as Director of Planning of the Health Department of the Basque Government. Dr. Thomas Seltner is an international expert leader in public health and health systems development and advises international organizations and national governments on health policies and reform. He currently serves as a Special Envoy in Financing for the World Health Organization, where he advises the Director General on the identification of an improved financing framework for the organization. From 1991 to 2009, Dr. Zeltner served as a Secretary of State for Health and Director General of the Swiss Federal Office of Public Health. Among Dr. Zeltner's many accomplishments, he is the co-founder of the Global Patient Safety Forum, President of the Blood Transfusion CRS Switzerland, and Board Member of the Swiss Academies of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Zeltner graduated with an MD and master's degree in law from University of Bern, Switzerland, and holds specialist degrees in human pathology and forensic medicine. He has been a professor of public health at the University of Bern since 1992. As I turn the program over to our moderator, Dr. Tom Bossert, director of the International Health Systems Program, please join me in welcoming Dr. Bengoa and Dr. Zeltner. <laughs> Well, thank you both for coming, uh, and um, I, I want to ask you a, a few questions. Uh, we usually only have one, uh, one person responding, so there may be a little difficulty, and I may have to shorten, <laughs> shorten your discussions. Um, but um, the emphasis of this program is about leadership and about management and what it's like for people like you who have been at the top levels uh, in management in, in your countries or in the province, uh, region uh, in Spain. Um, and uh, I was struck, uh, I was with a, in a meeting with uh, Julio Frank uh, and a, another minister, uh, and they, one of the things that they mentioned to each other was how lonely it was being a minister at that, at that level. And so I wonder if in your experience you find that that's true, and then how, how does that, uh, how do you deal with that as a leader or as someone who deals with management? He was lonelier, so we'll <laughs> use <laughs> Why do you know that? <laughs> as a matter of fact, uh, it's very true. I'm, I mean, if you look what you're doing as a minister and uh, if you look at your agenda, you would feel, you would see that your day is actually packed with talking to people, interacting with people. So the whole day consists of dialogues uh, and then why could and might you be lonely? That's really uh, the question. And I think I felt particularly lonely in times of crisis when you had to take decisions and far going decisions not knowing what is that the right thing to do or not let me give you an example we you know when SARS uh, came up and we had uh, cases in Hong Kong we had cases already in Canada mm -hmm. um, there were a big uh, there was a big exhibition in Basel in Switzerland planned and so we had to make within 12 hours dec the decision whether we would like uh, people from uh, Hong Kong to come to Switzerland or not mm -hmm. and we knew 
that uh, that would uh, and it, it was calculated after it this has actually had a financial impact of I think three or four billion US dollars uh, and then you have to make this decision nobody actually can help you and so then uh, you know the principle of precaution prevails and you say don't take any risk and say no but that is then when it's getting very hard your I advisors can't just tell you they which can't the right uh, no you they have can't to you have at the end uh, you have to take the responsibility yeah. and you actually also bear the responsibility i mean that's, uh, uh, that's normally the case when you then uh, if there was, uh, the decision was wrong you have to step down that's <laughs> part of the game he didn't step Raphael. down <laughs> no, no, well, made the right decision. Uh, I was made actually, the right decision. I was, uh, no, 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 I was asked to step, I mean, uh, then he said he has to step down, that's too expensive. But uh, then I got actually Margaret Chan, the Director General of uh, WHO at that time was Minister of Health in Hong Kong. She had to step down <laughs> because of that. I had not to step down and we uh, laugh sometimes about this uh, past, come past. Okay, I think the um, uh, um, <coughs> it, it's lonely, but that's what you're there for. Um, so you have to assume uh, uh, loneliness in those positions uh, in the same way that you have to assume loneliness also when you're managing in a hospital and a public health group, uh, a group of people. Because sometimes you just, uh, the, the buck stops at your decision. You can't take it up. I couldn't take up to the president a whole bunch of decisions because, it's, well, you know, that's your job. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so it feels long. I also, I also think it's important because, for example, uh, we're both independent in the sense that you're not part of a, uh, the, the party politics. Um, <clears throat> the, my colleagues and I was, we were, we were two independents in, in the Basque government and the rest were uh, formal politicians. Um, it's different if you are in, or not in the sense that um, when there were the crisis or when you didn't really know what to do, they know where to go. They have their little club, they have their party, they, they um, th to go to them and ask for advice. You can't do that, you don't do that. So um, there's a bit of loneliness in the sense of accepting a job as an independent. And the other issue um, is the long-term, uh, short-term issue. Uh, the people around you are all ex are expecting uh, these quick, short-term decisions, and you could get caught up in that wheel. Um, but I think the key leadership issue where you feel most lonely is not in that day-to-day -day wheeling, um, the, 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 the mousetrap part of, of our job, but in the, uh, the more um, uh, midterm, as Thomas was saying, the most midterm, because there you're, there's a bit more speculation. You're leaning on evidence, but you're also, you have less information um, of where you're taking the system in terms of reform and transformation. And there you feel more lonely because most of your team is not on board <laughs> with you. You just have to convince people. Interesting. Uh, I, I, interesting because I didn't feel in these instances as lonely as that. Because then you have time, you can consult, you have your experts. And I mean, the nice thing about public health is and new public health policies that you try to, uh, you know, to have some kind of evidence-based policy making. And so you reflect, etc. So I felt in these situations rather more comfortable because then because you're say, Swiss you see sure <laughs> that they come in come in yeah, come you're, in you're uh, a rich country yeah, yeah. right my, my country maybe have a drink. So. that may be a big difference that's true yeah. so yeah. it's a different yeah, well that you've raised another question that i think is quite quite important and that is you may be the top at uh, in terms of responsibility for the health sector but you also have to work with the president or the prime minister or someone who is not involved in the health sector who has responsibilities for other kinds of political choices that may go counter to what you want to do. For instance, with uh, alcohol reform kinds of issues or tobacco or those sorts of things. What, can you talk a little about the experiences that you've had where you have to, in a sense, be a lobbyist and have to argue with someone else who's another decision maker, another leader who has other priorities and what you have to do? Well, I think, um, I think the, the key issue um, <coughs> is, is, is 
to be knowledgeable about the system when you accept some of these jobs. I mean, a lot of people are accepting uh, <coughs> either ministerial job, di director general job <coughs> in healthcare, um, not knowing the unbelievable complexity there is in, in there. So, um, <coughs> in, 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 it's important to arrive to the job uh, knowing almost exactly what you want to do in two things, the content, in content, this is when I do, I want to improve quality or patient safety or uh, connect public health with health services, whatever. Um, but uh, in relation to your question, um, you should also be uh, fairly mature in leadership, in, in knowing yourself, and especially um, your, your own, the leadership style you want to follow, um, which I think is really important uh, because um, if you go in there um, with a control and command attitude, um, uh, well, that, that was okay before, but actually now uh, you, we still see it with a lot of people. Uh, and then they're actually surprised to see that um, uh, the healthcare professionals, for example, react negatively or you can't, uh, you can't actually implement your program. Um, <clears throat> this is important because that the, 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 your leadership capacity and the way you manage your leadership style um, is also very important the way you, you manage up, going to your question. Uh, the way you manage upwards with your president is, uh, has, has to be, not sure if it's lobbying, but it has to be, um, uh, it's very important to say very quickly, the first two weeks, I know why, what I want to do. Because um, if you let time go, uh, if you let time go, then the Minister of Finance takes over. And that's why a lot of people uh, say, well, the Ministers of Health um, don't really count very much and they're the soft guys in the office. But unless, unless you move really quickly because you know what your, your business is, you know what your leadership style is, and then you go in there and then you take, you say, both your President and the Finance Minister by surprise. You just go in and do it. <laughs> It's very important. Yeah, to like catch you, you were talking about Julio. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I think uh, you know I, I have been uh, in function very long, as you have seen. And I, looking back at 19 years, I, I think I have only two, three, four uh, events in my past where there was really a clear no from the superior level don't do that, we don't support you in doing that. And most of the time it really had to do with tobacco and or alcohol. And uh, just shows you how difficult these issues are. Um, and, uh, you know, one of them was, you know, should we not uh, sell alcohol uh, overnight uh, in shops, etc. And there suddenly there was such a huge resistance also from the prime minister that he said, forget about that. But that's actually pretty, I think, uh, not so frequent. Uh, much more difficult, I think, is the question of the inertia of the system. You know, uh, we all know that the uh, determinants of health are outside of your portfolio. It's education, it's transport, it's urban planning, all these things. And uh, then you go to the other ministries and departments and try to convince them to do something. And that's the tricky part of the job. Uh, I think to be a leader without having any kind of you know, uh, uh, hard leadership tools. You're just soft uh, uh, tools to convince them that for the public good, for prosperity, it is something we need to do together. And that's uh, where successes take a lot, a lot of time. And uh, you need to talk a lot and dialogue and understand how to make these processes happening. And this is the lobbying side of that. That's uh, the lobbying <laughs> side, that's the convincing side, um, that's uh, creating as much as you can um, uh, win-win situations. And I think, uh, as he said, um, a lot of to be successful in politics is to seize windows of opportunity. And they can only be sometimes two weeks. And you know this proposal goes to the parliament or this, and you have a chance just to get something in there. Uh, and mm -hmm. you try to do that. 
Very good, very good. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I wonder if we could um, shift to uh, uh, the question, I mean, we've been talking so far about the difficulties of being mm -hmm. uh, a leader. Um, uh, what of the experiences that you've had uh, gave you the most satisfaction about being a leader? What were the things that were, you know, that, were, that, that made it worthwhile? He had no. satisfactions, I didn't. You, so you didn't. You <laughs> Come on. You all, so all, of those, all of no, those reports a, didn't. That, that's actually, <laughs> it's, uh, it's true. It's, uh, uh, I, I always said that I had the, the most beautiful job, and the, the, the difficulty for me was to step down because I actually could have continued, and I said after 19 years, I think I have to stop now, and I can explain uh -huh. if you want later. But the, the beauty, at least in the Swiss condition, and Switzerland may be a little bit a different uh, situation than other countries, that you really can change things. You really can make a difference, mm -hmm. and that's beautiful. Yeah. You, you're there. You see, there is a problem. Uh, we had, when I started, a huge illicit drug problem with open drug scenes in Switzerland. And then we said, let's try something different. The whole world was against us. Uh, we had a huge debate with the UN organizations. And then we started with a completely new drug policy. And we mm -hmm. succeeded. And that's beautiful. And I think the most rewarding thing, and that's again uh, rather typical for Switzerland, uh, you know, many questions then can be brought to popular referendum. And uh, if then the population says, we like really what you did, and they say yes, and you have 60, 70 percent of voters saying yes, I think that's very rewarding. Well, um, you, you didn't have any. Sorry. I didn't have any. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to no, be no, really short. Right. Nothing satisfying. <laughs> that's no, there are. why he looks so, <laughs> so unhappy. There, there's some. There's. I mean, when you're given power and yes. you're given a system, um, uh, the whole story of all our generation. Take uh, the impact Julio oh. Frank had on on the uh, the uh, <coughs> insurance for the poor. Uh, in Mexico, okay, you can be lonely, you can be asked to, f to, to step out, but if you've been in there for four or five years and you've developed an insurance system or you've done a transformation in healthcare, which is, I think, what I, I've started in the Basque Country, you have to be very satisfied if it starts working. Uh, the trouble is, is, that is when something doesn't work. Uh, but actually, if you've done, if you've done things correctly, um, I think it is very satisfying to, to be in power and to use it well. But the comment in relation to that in leadership, I think, is um, <coughs> it's satisfying because you've been able to do it in a different way than it would have been done 20 years ago. Uh, for example, um, we designed a strategy around, we call it chronicity. Uh, uh, around uh, managing chronic conditions within a public system, um, integrating primary care and hospital care and patient engagement and um, integrating information systems and these things. Um, and all that is moving. It's not finished, it's moving. And it's, um, it's very satisfying to see um, when it started and how local leaders, which is, I think, what we tried to develop, um, a very distributive leadership arrangement, uh, were able to pull it off. And when you say, say, well, why did it work? It wasn't because we hit it off with the content, because everybody knows we have to engage patients or integrate care or whatever. It's the way you in get local leaders to engage with that agenda. And as soon as you see that going, uh, uh, um, it's working very well. He ha he stepped down. I was asked to step down, so that's a, a slight different. <laughs> well, that, 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 inter that issue, just before we, we sure. turn to question and answer, um, uh, the New York Times th th this morning um, announced that the, Ford, the head of the Ford Foundation, uh, who was a director of McKinsey, uh, is, is stepping down. And he said the hardest thing for a leader is to know when to step down. Sure. 
Um, I wonder, you, you were uh, suggesting that there might be more to your story yeah. about when to step no, down. It was really, it <coughs> took me a year to decide whether I should uh, step down or not, uh, and uh, because I l really loved and, uh, my job. And, uh, you know, part of uh, the, the nice thing of being a leader is really to be together with people. I mean, you need to love people and to uh, be uh, someone who, who likes to be together. And so uh, leaving um, a, a position means two, two things. A lot of unfinished projects. You would want to see how they evolve. And the second part is to leave a group of people you really like and have been working together. So that's difficult. I stepped down because um, I felt that Part of the job gets repetitive. One part of the job of a minister is sitting in committees uh, of the parliament, and that takes up quite a bit. And I started realizing that I get annoyed just <laughs> sitting there and listening again and again why uh, you know you should uh, test everybody for HIV AIDS or not and uh, and uh, you have yeah. the world record 19 uh, years right world right record. so uh, it's of, getting of parliamentary kind of uh, and the second thing is <laughs> this kind of leadership position and you have to be aware of it it's not a five day job. Mm -hmm. It's really 24 hours, 365 uh, 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 days a year. And worse, it's even, you know, the weekends are the most terrible time. It starts uh, Friday lunchtime and goes on because of the Sunday media all over the weekend. So you really Three times a week you have to call back your wife and say, I'm sorry, I will not be home for lunch or dinner, uh, be or lunch, so I uh, never went home uh, for lunch, but for dinner. Uh, and then you have guests at home and you can't show up. And so it's all these things uh, uh, which really interfere with your private life. My wife always said, uh, you're married to two entities, <laughs> <laughs> your job and uh, your uh, me. And that sounds better. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and uh, it, it, it's really true. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the job or the, the function takes up so much of you yeah. that it is with the time you feel it's a kind of nice to step down a little bit. So uh, it might be better to be told that you have to leave. That's right. <laughs> well, they lost the elections, and so uh, basically you just move on. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think what's very important is that um, uh, we were there almost four years, and then in four years, uh, um, for me, the lesson, the learning has been that if you know what you're doing and you you identify the leadership arrangement that you want to imp how do you, how you want to implement things, um, you can do really a lot of things in four years. Because um, a lot of people say, oh, you don't have time, and these things never, the policy cycle, then the next guy comes around and knocks it off. Well, no, because let me give you an example. Um, when I came in, historically, people, um, th this is over two and a half million, uh, three million population. Basically, you have a whole bunch of hospitals, and then you have, so you have managers all over the place. What no normally happens in the political shifts in, in Spain uh, in most of Southern Europe is that you just remove everybody because they're, they're supposed to be from the political party before. I left 80% uh, of the existing people and um, didn't ask what political allegiance they had. And um, that uh, move uh, tactically has proved to be very, very interesting because now they're back in power and um, th they themselves were engaged in these reforms that we started and they're going to continue them, and they're pushing the new guys uh, up on top, my success, to continue with what we're doing. So there's strategies that you can follow in order to break the political cycle, which tends to say, well, that's not my baby. I'm going to start a new one. Very good. OK, I'd like to open us up for questions now. And uh, please uh, identify yourselves and stand when you have a question. Oh, surely. You're Harvard students. Surely you, <laughs> you have questions. 
Well, hello, thank you for coming. My name is Germán Orrego. I'm from Chile. I am doing my PhD, here, my doctoral program here in environmental health. But my question is, how do you deal when you receive a lot of pressure uh, from the media? For instance, one example, I remember in 2009 with the uh, swine flu, and all the countries start to spend a lot of money in the new drug for treatment this epidemia, and finally it was less dangerous than the normal flu. I mean, um, working with the media, uh, working with the traditional media, and actually these days working with social media is key. And uh, uh, to be a good communicator is key for jobs like mine, uh, or, or used to be. And uh, you're right. I mean, you need to know how to make very complicated things clear in the short term. And uh, you need to be able also to um, go through many, many thunderstorms of misunderstandings by media, by campaigns. And you know, you need to know that not you as a person, but you as a function are in the focus of um, lobby groups again. I mean, the tobacco industry had professional people hired to destroy, destroy my reputation. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of uh, media coverage saying Seltner is a health Taliban, and we had to get rid of this Taliban. Uh, and uh, so, and you need to be able to make the distinction of attacks uh, against your function and attacks against your personality or even worse, against your family. And that's, you need to learn. And again, that's a matter of your relationship with your family. You, you need to prepare your wife, your children, that, uh, you know, uh, people might want you to look very unpopular. Not easy. Not easy. It didn't work. You're very popular. So <laughs> uh, yeah, well, because I think uh, the, the, the key there is to be clear and authentic. I, I really never, I mean, that's the, the other thing. You, you never lie. Any lie will come out. So never lie. So uh, the, you know, even my opponents said, at least he is doing his job and he is defending his case. We used uh, an approach in relation to your question. Uh, you may have been working here at the school on um, an approach, a technique called appreciative inquiry. Um, what we did in, in with uh, the H1N1, which is just when I started being a minister and that, that blew up at that moment, um, <clears throat> was to say to the media, you're not only here to report that information. We need you in order to control the situation. So we, we took them, we tried, uh, not all of them, we tried to take them to a situation in which they had an educational component. Half of them don't think they have that component. Uh, freedom of press, we say whatever we like. Uh, but some of them, with several discussions, um, said, yes, we do. Um, the important thing is that, what, and what we put on the table, and we said, well, we don't know how serious this one's going to be, but if it's as serious as the avian flu, you and your work is, are going to control more the reaction and the epidemic and the social reaction to the epidemic than whatever I say. So you guys have to take a very big decision now about whether um, you are an agent or you're just doing your traditional paperwork. Uh, because you want to sell papers. Um, and that's sort of work we didn't need it all. But it's, it's fairly important because, for example, we are going to have emergent uh, epidemics. Uh, and some of them may be very serious because of the mutations and all these things. Uh, <clears throat> when one of those happens, we should now, be wor between the epidemics, be working uh, with the media to see how we would handle a very serious one. That's work we should be doing between the epidemics, not when the epidemic's on top. Because once it's on top, then it's, it's much tougher. But now some media should be 
considering themselves as what is it and how are we going to operate in that setting? I think uh, I agree completely. I mean, to you work bet. with the with the media must be uh, you know a constant one and uh, one of trust. Uh, we failed completely, and actually the the, the report down uh, for the, the World Health Organization, whether they performed well or not, showed uh, the same thing. We failed completely when it comes to social media. And uh, the social media with uh, m wrong information uh, during the pandemic uh, was a disaster for so us. The readers are too old. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we, uh, well, it, uh, we didn't know how to counteract. You know, there was all these, me uh, these emails going around that uh, the virus uh, was a post uh, Gulf War. Uh, syndrome related thing and that uh, it was a uh, terrorism who had uh, uh, and you shouldn't get uh, vaccinated etc and we were not able to counter this in any way and it's I think that's a challenge for the we're future. We're not ready yeah, for the next one. Yeah. You guys have to be ready. Yep. Other questions? Yeah. <coughs> Stand Thank up, you. Please. Thank you. Um, Lucas Atoka, I'm regional Spanish. And I have a question about how do you see the paradigm of the European socialized health systems in this climate of budget constraints that might not affect you, at least for now, but at least uh, definitely the southern economies. Um, and whether we're going to see a breaking down of the systems that we used to or a wave of privatization like certain regions, talking about Madrid yeah. or Valencia are experiencing in Spain, like are you hopeful or optimistic on how things are going to evolve in the next few years or is it all going to go down to pieces? Otherwise, can't just listen. I think we should make one, one caveat here, and that is that the content of the answer should be focused on, on the leadership issues sure. related to this. Yeah, okay. But I mean, uh, the... Um, it is a leadership issue in the sense that some people um, are doing quick and dirty interventions on their systems which may break them in some regions. Um, there's a, a, a badly organized privatization, for example, in some parts of Spain. Some people are talking about in Italy and Greece and other places. So um, I think the important thing, and I'm very optimistic, is that we've had 40 or 45 years of, of building a very resilient system. Uh, resi re and, 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 and so um, once, once you have a crisis like the one we have in Spain now, um, what actually you should be doing is making sure education and health are protected as systems, not, not being intervening on them in an artificial way. Um, and I think uh, the, the, even people who are beginning to do certain things on the health care are not going to get away with it because it's very resilient. I, you always like the story of, uh, of, of why it's important to, to have a strong health system and health and social system in any country because these crises are always coming and going. And I think the best example is when you see Finland in the early 90s went up to about you know, a very deep crisis, went up to 18% unemployment. Um, and next door, Russia uh, had uh, the same crisis at the same time. Um, Finland had a very resilient and strong health system. Russia didn't. Um, the health outcomes and the public health, the big indicators we all use um, in Finland, were not hit uh, by that, uh, by that um, uh, economic crisis. And in Russia, there's a very, there's a very dramatic uh, Im impact on, on health results. So, why do you need a strong health system here? And that's why, actually, it's very important here in the States uh, to, to support what is actually happening now with the American administration, because it's not just good for the, for the individual who is going to get health care because he wasn't covered. It's because af after when you do have crisis, economic crisis or any other type of crisis, you have a resilient system sure. there helping the society to survive. I just add yes. uh, one mm -hmm. point, and I, I was uh, uh, amazed too. A student here, uh, Mahi Ben, I don't know whether you know him, he was looking into data of 30 years of uh, economic growth or crisis, and he uh, in 100 and something countries. And the fact is, in 30 years, 
there are, were seven and a half crises in average in each of the countries. So financial crisis, even in Switzerland, even in Switzerland. Even in Switzerland. I mean, we had yeah. a couple of uh, serious uh, <laughs> downturns. Uh, so uh, as you, as, yeah, 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 he seems to, I mean, he has been living yeah. in, uh, in Geneva for a long time, so he knows what he I didn't about. create it. <laughs> but your wife and family, because <laughs> I didn't shop. <laughs> no, so That's right. At, uh, but I have not seen, you know, we all prepare more or less for um, infectious diseases, pandemics. I have not seen any planning uh, in any health ministry when it comes to a financial crisis. And there will, I mean, we're mi in the midst of one, and it is for sure the next will come. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, great. it's amazing. And we, we just don't uh, take that seriously enough. Even at the international level, with WHO. Even at the uh, even at the international level, and uh, WHO is uh, really into a serious crisis, because uh, WHO consists, as you know, of 194 countries, out of which 10 pay 60 percent and 20 pay more than 80 percent of the budget, and these are precisely the the countries EU countries and uh, the US yes. who are in a crisis. And so the, the budget of WHO is uh, really in deep trouble. Okay. Another question. Yeah. Um, hi, thank you for sharing your stories and experience with us. Uh, my name is Azalea. I'm originally from Indonesia, and I'm here doing a master in epidemiology. Um, my question is, how would you see or uh, your role externally so when you are um, engaging with c other countries mm. um, maybe s developing countries and where the leadership role is not really clear on which countries so how would you how would you um, know like when to take leader to be the leader in those kind of like meetings or conferences that's going on between ministers of health thank you very, very important point. I think, you know, I always say a, a, a minister of health has actually three jobs, and you can split these jobs if you would want. You run and you're responsible for the health system in your country with all aspects. Secondly, you are uh, the advocate for health in all other policies. That's this role of uh, intervening in other ministries, completely something different. And thirdly, you're representing your country internationally when it comes to health. And the problem many countries do have is that, and I'm t just talking about Switzerland, health issues are debated, of course, at WHO. So there I say we need access uh, to medications everywhere. My colleague from the Ministry of Economics uh, sits in uh, the World Trade Organization, and he says, no, 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 patents are so important for us, and has a completely different position. Uh, so we were confronted with the fact, what is actually the position of Switzerland? Mm -hmm. And uh, um, in one organization you say <coughs> green, in the other you say red, and uh, that can't be. So th the question of policy coherence when it comes uh, towards uh, representing your country is extremely important, and that's the reason why we created something we call uh, the Swiss Health Foreign Policy which is really uh, defining within the country uh, what are the priorities of the country. And I think that's a very important thing. I'm not sure if I'm going to answer your question, but I think um, <coughs> what's really important is for um, low-income countries, in, in terms of the design of health care, the way we've organized health care, uh, not to do what we've done in the North. And so, People who go to countries, whether it's consulting groups or ministers that go there, and the, um, <clears throat> the, the, the key element is to <clears throat> very quickly understand what the situation is and help them design their own thing, but saying, make sure you don't do some of the weaknesses we have. Because we're all trying to get away now from uh, something um, <clears throat> which may have been um, 
reasonable, but for example, <clears throat> you don't want them to be technology freaks like we are in the North, and just buying it, all, all, all these uh, things uh, that are not evidence-based half of the time, etc. Um, and so it's useful to go over there and say, well, look, where we are going is towards more community care, more primary care, more home care. Uh, but don't get so excited with all these huge hospitals we've built. So, so your recommendations should be about where we are going, uh, but make sure you, you don't go there having gone through what we've done, because we've we've, we haven't pulled it off. Uh, in, in the right. United States, we have that same problem when we go overseas. <laughs> yeah. Even worse. Can yeah. I okay, just add it. one thing, because <coughs> I think it's really uh, important for you. You know, uh, international health is the art of negotiation and you can learn that and that's a, n a new uh, you know new area which is called health diplomacy mm -hmm. and uh, global health diplomacy and it makes sense if you go into this uh, area to really look into how do uh, do i am a good health diplomat for my country okay. other questions <coughs> yeah <coughs> Thank you for being here. My name is Natalie. I'm a master's student in the Global Health and Population Department. That actually leads perfectly into my question. So I was going to ask, both of you have extremely distinguished health careers. So earlier in your careers, what are the experiences or the skills that you found to be really helpful in those times of crises later in your careers that led you to that point? And what would, you, what would be your advice to us? You see that we have known each other for quite some time. <laughs> My body language. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, um, I think it's really important to um, uh, uh, to spend as much time learning about yourself and the types of the type of leader you want to be. Uh, there's a sort of in introspection or dark side into that, knowing how that things are not black or white and that you need to be able to work in very ambiguous uh, terms. And you have to, that, um, as much time on that than on learning how a health systems work. Because I think most people that try to go through a career, you start learning, okay, the German system operates like that, the Swiss system like that, and I've learned a really interesting um, uh, tuberculosis project somewhere. But the important thing is that those are all things that you're going to pick up um, as you move on. The thing that you have to no nurture continuously during that ride uh, for those 30, 35 years is this continuous introspection of, of, of whether you like what you see when you look in the mirror in terms of leadership behavior. Mm -hmm. My mm, pretty similar answer. First of all, I would uh, recommend read the still very good book by David Gurdon, Eyewitness of Power. And he actually says uh, you need to look into three areas. One is really uh, what are leadership skills and what is f per primarily soft leadership uh, in our context because as a minister or you don't actually have too much strong hard leadership tools. The second thing he says and I agree completely you need to understand what you're doing and that means you need to understand how uh, health systems work if you want to go there. And that's, in my uh, understanding, mostly understanding complex systems and how you run complex systems. And the third one is you need to work on your personality and on your character. And as David Gergen shows, if you, most leaders who failed, it's not point A or B, it's the character. And so uh, you, it makes sense always to reflect what are you doing? Are you lying to yourself? Uh, are you getting corrupted by the power you have, etc.? And that's very important. Both of you were trained as doctors first. Um, is there something about leadership and being a doctor? Many of the students also uh, have. Well, patients ask me to do something else. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> so, yeah. But is there something uh, about that kind of training that is useful or not? 
What do you think, Thomas? I think it's helpful. I mean, leading m leadership is working with people. And that you really learn uh, when uh, being a doctor. Leadership is a lot about listening. Uh, and that you Which do. Which is not a strong point of doctor. In the past, it should be. It should be. <laughs> yes, I, I agree. I agree. Uh, and so, no, I think it is one of the um, possibilities to develop mm. uh, leadership skills. Um, he is right. Uh, lead, uh, uh, academic leaders, uh, doctor leaders, professors, uh, particularly in clinical settings, they tend to become a little autocratic, autistic, and you need to be careful not to do that. Mm -hmm. I, I <coughs> the, the only point I would make, I don't think the medicine itself has any, uh, they, it's useful when you reach certain positions to, um, to use it tactically. So for example, when I go to, I don't know, I, I read management and policy, so I don't read medicine. I'm no longer a doctor. Um, so much so that doctors say, well, you're a trader now because you, you even talk like an economist. <laughs> and, and so um, when you stop reading medicine, well, that's fine. You have to, uh, there's a moment you have to choose what you are. Um, <clears throat> once you've chosen that you're going to be in the management or uh, public health uh, <clears throat> policy perspective, um, I think the uh, the key point is to um, is to make sure that you read a lot I of that because it's not stuff it's not stuff that a lot of people say. Well, all that side is common sense stuff. No, there's there's a lot of reading. There's a lot of knowledge that has to be brought up in in all these uh, in all these issues. Um, but going back to the point on tactics is when I'm when I go to the school of doctors or whatever I say, uh, I say yeah as a doctor, <laughs> as a doc so I use it, I use it so so it not just connects with you. So the you, the guys in the room and the people in the room basically say well okay he's one of us, uh, uh, he's one of us. So you can use it from certain positions, but it's um, it's 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 a trick. I don't think there's anything in it which is, um, yeah, I think, uh, almost any discipline. Uh, <clears throat> any discipline, any person who works the leadership skills that we've been talking about um, should be able to be a health minister or whatever minister in top position. That, that's quite interesting. Uh, the way you pose this is that it's not only uh, the experience of being a leader and learning on the job, but part of being on the job is also reading and finding out how other people have addressed these kinds of issues as you face them. So uh, it may not be in a classroom, as many people are doing, but you also still have to learn of in course. that process uh, uh, from management Definitely. techniques yeah. and that sort of thing. Definitely, mm -hmm. and I mean, the probably, and that comes back to the first question you had, um, <clears throat> which is uh, the, the, the loneliness. Uh, for I always thought the most rewarding learning sessions I had was uh, going and meet with other ministers and sometimes their staff. There uh, are, I mean, a couple of um, um, occasions a year. Of course, the World Health Assembly is one, then uh, the OECD meetings are one, and then bilateral meetings with ministers. And I think. Uh, this kind of peer learning and exchanging uh, and learning what others would do in that uh, situation is very helpful. Good. Well, I think we've run out of time. Thank you very much for, uh, for joining us you, and Tom. for all of your insights into this uh, major issue of how to be a good leader <laughs> in, in global health. Thank you very well, much. Thank you. Thank you.